Kaepernick's collusion grievance against the NFL has the potential to shake up the league. Lonzo Ball takes a hit and then prays. The New York Yankees could not get over the hump. Could the NBA and Nike disconnect? Jeremy Lin is out for the season. And who and what are off topic this week? All that and more on What's a 401 Sports, coming right up. Welcome everyone and thanks for joining us for this week's edition of What's the 401 Sports. I'm Keisha Wilson. And I'm Mike McDonald. I hope you all had a great week, so let's just get right to it. As we know, currently unemployed NFL quarterback Colin Kaepernick has filed a grievance against the NFL, citing NFL owners colluded to keep him out of the league because of his protest during the national anthem. If successful, some say that not only could Ka Kaepernick get his job back, but he could lead to the early termination of the present collective bargaining agreement that is set to expire in 2021. Mike, I ask you, with this kind of notion being floated in the air, do you think that this grievance is more than what the NFL owners are bargaining for? You know, I'm not sure if this is something that's going to wind up shaking the collective bargaining agreement. And for them, to ha for that to happen, they're going to have to prove collusion, showing that two teams had an agreement and and went ahead and tried to prevent Kaepernick from signing with either one of them. It's going to be tough. Now, crazier things have happened, but I think what this is going to do is it's really going to cause another black eye on the NFL. And what I mean by that is, you know, Kaepernick and his lawyer are going to have access. To regarding 32 football teams and their private conversations, be it within their organization and between other organizations. And I think that there are some things, private conversations in particular, that they don't want to be seen as public record. And I think as far as the collusion, even if they can't prove that there was collusion, I think that Colin Kaepernick can certainly make some headway here. And I think that this is also going to feed into the backlash that Kaepernick has created, not necessarily created, but everything that's gone on since this whole issue with not standing for the national anthem. So as far as whether or not they're going to be able to prove collusion, I think it's going to be an awfully tough case. But there is no question that Kaepernick and his lawyers have certainly, they're on to something. And I don't think that his high profile lawyer, Mark Gregoros, I, I, I don't want to butcher his last name, but he wouldn't have taken on this case if he didn't think he could make something out of it. Well, I think that the his legal team has an uphill battle because he has to prove collusion and between two or more teams. And collusion doesn't necessarily, um, personnel decisions don't necessarily mean collusion. There are many statistics that support that Kaepernick is better than, at minimum, 25% of the active quarterbacks on rosters right now. But then there are other statistics that say that he's not as good as some of the quarterbacks that are currently employed right now. So I think that's going to be really tough if you can't use that as an argument for collusion. And you were mentioning the uh, his legal team having access to private conversations, but it has to be written, document, documented private conversations. And if they don't have that, it has to have clear, convincing evidence. And if they don't have anything that's in writing, it's going to be really hard for his legal team. I think that, you know, there it's, it's not saying it's impossible. There might be a smoking gun somewhere because there might there's always somebody at, at any given time who is not as discreet as someone and who is quick to press send. So if the legal team can really weave through, and I don't know what kind of access, to what information they have access to and what in this type of proceeding, if anything could be subpoenaed. I don't know if you can subpoena somebody's cell phone records because everybody is mobile now and you can send emails through your mobile phone and text messages through your mobile phone so i don't know if they can have access to that so it's going to be really interesting to see how this all uh falls out and you know maybe i i think the the players are probably more interested in this and and more excited about the possibility of this collective bargaining agreement being canceled because they don't like it because of what they gave up in terms of power. So we'll just kind of see. And Keisha, staying with the NFL, it turns out that Dallas Cowboys owner Jerry Jones did not stand for the national anthem during his first game as the Cowboys owner. He was actually sitting with the actress Liz Taylor while the anthem was being played. And this prompted a fan to write this note. Jeers to Jerry Jones and Liz Taylor, who were the only two people at last Sunday's Cowboys-Redskins game not standing when the national anthem was being played. 
Riding out in a cart just before the anthem began was bad enough, but sitting while it was played was more than many of us could handle. Jerry, please note that in Texas, we stand for the national anthem. P.S. Tom Landry always took off his hat. So, Keisha, I ask you, has Jerry Jones become patriotic over time, or is this basically just to please fans? I mean, I find this whole issue of patriotism in sports to be quite interesting since it's been dominating the news cycles for the past year or so. And, I, you know, the NFL as a whole, I don't think has been overly patriotic. It wasn't until 2009 that the players are actually on the field during the playing of the national anthem. And then there was the whole exchange of money between the NFL, among other pro sports teams, and the Department of Defense to have you know, homecomings, flag presentations, and other military-type events happening during the game. And so maybe over the course of time, the NFL and, by extension, Jerry Jones has cowered to some of the fans. But I question if these fans are the majority in terms of patriotism. Because I've been to quite a few sporting events over the course of my life both basketball and football, and myself and no one that I know is rushing to the stadium just so they could be there for the national anthem. And when you, when I've gotten there during the playing of the national anthem, people are using the bathroom, they're at the concession stands, they're walking to their seats. Nobody stops and, and, and waits until the, at, the anthem is over. So life still goes on while this happens. So I wonder if these patriotic fans are the majority. And I, and also, I bet you if you polled the people who are milling around during the anthem and asked them if they are patriotic, I'm sure a good majority of them will say that they are. So I think maybe this is some kind of carrying to the fans over the course of time. But I, I just, um, I just, this conversation, the way, you know, anthems and the patriotism and, and standing up for injustices is evolved. It just, it's starting to make me feel uncomfortable. Yeah, well, and you know, the thing with Jerry, I mean, I think to answer the question, I think, yes, Jerry Jones does want to please fans. He does want to please uh, the sponsors, and he does want to please the people within the National Football League. However, um, you know, the way that he has certainly flip-flopped over the last several weeks, without a doubt, leaves you know, many to question what's going on with this guy, because both sides have really been disturbed with Jerry Jones. You get the conservatives who are saying that he didn't clamp down on the Cowboys enough when they had that Monday night football game against the Cardinals and when they kneeled before the anthem was being played. And then, of course, you have liberals who are saying that he hasn't been really strict enough with how he's handled some of the situation. Not necessarily strict enough, but that the way that he responded after that Cowboys loss a couple of weeks ago where he demanded that his players were going to, if they didn't st stand for the anthem, they weren't going to play. So I think that there's a lot of hypocrisy going on with Jerry Jones where he goes one way and then he goes the other way and it's hard to kind of figure out. Now I get it, this guy's head of a billion dollar conglomerate, one of the most famous sports franchises in the world, the Dallas Cowboys. But at the same time, I think there's a lot of indecisiveness that he's been leading towards with the whole situation here. When we look at it over the last couple of months, the way that this has played out, it certainly has to question what Jerry Jones's intentions have been. We're going to talk about Lonzo Ball. The LA Laker had a horrible season, uh, NBA season debut, but he rebounded quite nicely in his second game against the Phoenix Suns. Lonzo Ball flirted with a triple-double, scoring 29 points, grabbing 11 rebounds, and dishing out 9 assists. And he drilled four three-pointers in the process. Mike, with all the conversations surrounding Lonzo and his father, Laval Ball, how long do you think that it will take for people to really begin to judge Lonzo on his merits? Well, I think it comes down to two, three things. One is the success of the Los Angeles Lakers. That's the most important thing. The other thing is the success specifically of Lonzo Ball and how he goes out with his rookie season. But I think the relationship that he has with his father, without a doubt, that is going to be bringing a lot of negative exposure to him. And a lot of, a lot of these veteran NBA players want to go after him, not just because he's a rookie and they want to shut him down, but because they see his father on ESPN, they see him on Fox Sports, and they want to shut the guy up. And I think that that also, a lot of players realize that the way that he's promoted uh, both Lonzo and the father, more importantly the father, this big baller brand, the big baller brand, I think it's turned off a lot of 
fans and players as well. And I think that that's just going to give them more motivation to go out and, and you know, shut this kid down and, and make him go have a horrible game. But I think that, you know, success speaks for itself. And if Lonzo Ball does have a sensational rookie season, wins rookie of the year, uh, that's going to definitely shut a lot of critics up. But it's also going to put the attention towards Lonzo and not necessarily towards the dad. I mean, you pretty much hit the nail on the head. I think it's going to be – it's not going to happen this season – Players are going to continue to line up to be the one that takes Lonzo down. Patrick Beverly is, is probably circled November 27th on his date, on his calendar, because that's when the Clippers and the Lakers will play again. And Patrick Beverly got the better of Lonzo during that first matchup. And even in defeat, LeVar kept talking. So saying that that's the last time we're going to hear about Patrick Beverly or have an interview with Patrick Beverly. And Patrick Beverly is not one of those players that's going to take those words lightly. So it's going to, it's going to be hard because I think no matter if Lonzo is successful or not, on the, or, or not on the court, his father is still going to be there. He doesn't know how to take defeat humbly. So it's going to be a while. And as you said, veterans are, you know, tend to always want to give the welcome to the league uh, to the rookies, and you take that with Lavar and just how he, how he can just really get under people's skin. That means Lonzo is in for a tough rookie season and probably a sophomore season. And once he really gets his his NBA sea legs and gets to be, you know, who he thinks who we think he can be and who the hype says he is, then that will quiet people. Well, don't go anywhere because when we come back, we have more of what's popping. And now we have some quick bites. In NFL news, Chris Long has donated his entire salary towards boosting racial equality in education. ESPN sportscaster Jamel Hill is back on the job from suspension and she is not mad at the network. Kevin Durant admits, quote, a couple years ago, I really didn't know how to play team defense that well. More and more, I'm learning about team defense and making multiple efforts, end quote. In separate incidents, New Orleans Pelicans DeMarcus Cousins and Boston Celtics Kyrie Irving were both fined $25,000 for foul language aimed at fans. In Sacramento, the Kings hired Jenny Buchek, assistant player development coach. Buchek is the second female active assistant coach, joining Becky Hammond of the San Antonio Spurs. And in news close to home, the New York Liberty hired Katie Smith as their new head coach. Welcome back to What's the 401 Sports. Well, Mike, it looks like someone is eager to chat about Donald Trump. In speaking with USA Today, Jacksonville Jaguars owner Shad Khan doubled down on his critique on Trump overall, Trump's attacks on minorities, and of course, Trump's war of words and ire aimed at the NFL. Shad said, Khan said, quote, let's get real. The attacks on Muslims, the attacks on minorities, the attacks on Jews, I think the NFL doesn't even come close to that on the level of being offensive. Here, it's about money or messing with, trying to soil a league or a brand that he's a jealous of, end quote. Khan goes on to respond to whether or not he regrets donating money to Trump's inaugural fund by saying, quote, I have no regrets in life. This ugly, toxic side sours the whole experience, end quote. Mike, why do you think Khan is continuously talking about Trump? Do you think that he is trying to distance himself from the other owners in the NFL? And what do you think? And if you, and do you think that we'll hear from Khan going forward? Yes, absolutely. We're going to hear from him continuing to go forward. There's no question about that. And I think he is trying to distance, distance himself. You know, I think we covered last week how he sort of called out some of the racist ownership uh, with some of the older owners uh, throughout the NFL. As far as his end game, you know, I think a lot of this is, he, is anger, bitterness towards the comments that Trump made uh, where he referred to the players as SOBs, you know, a couple, about, you know, several weeks ago. So I think a lot, there's some bitterness there. Everything that he said about Trump in the com in the quote that you just gave, I thought he hit on the head as far as him being jealous that this was a league that he got boxed out of and could not be a car par part of. Let's face it, a lot of people have hinted at the fact that this guy has a narcissistic personality disorder. Um, Donald Trump I'm talking about. And there's no question that this is something that the fact that he couldn't become part of the NFL, now he wants to sort of go back at them. To end with Khan, I think the big thing for me is 
you know, I, I'm supportive of everything that he's sort of come out and said over the last several weeks. At the same time, it's a little bit difficult for me when he's making his comments, I have no regrets. Well, why can't you just admit that you made a mistake by going ahead and supporting this guy who's led this sort of fascist movement throughout this country? Right. You know, Khan can try to distance himself from the other owners as much as he wants to, but in in reality, he's very much like them in a sense. He, along with some of the other owners, voted for Trump. And this is the same Trump while he was on his campaign trail, if I'm not mistaken, was calling for a Muslim ban. And he also, he, Trump, wanted a wall to, to keep out a certain population, a certain ethnicity from the United States. Khan, in his quote, talked about how Trump attacked minorities and Jews. Well, you know what? Khan is a minority in this country. So given all of that, he still voted for this person. And Khan was also, just like the other owners, one who did not have Colin Kaepernick come in for his organization for a tryout. When you have Blake Bortles on your quarterback, Ross, as your quarterback, and then the, the his backup is not much better, there's no reason why he could not be in there. And I just don't want to hear from Colin any more about Trump. I want him to talk about more initiatives that he's doing to help, like min to help yeah. minorities. Well, Keisha, we go on to the NBA, where Nike is in the first year of their jersey deal with the league. And on opening night, arguably their biggest endorser, LeBron James, had his Nike jersey split right down the middle of his back. Now, it might be taken as a fluke if it only happened to LeBron, but in a preseason game, half of the back of Tyler Ennis's jersey had came apart as well. So, Keisha, I ask... You know, when LeBron, he didn't miss a beat when he was playing, but Nike execs are very embarrassed. Could there be a Nike NBA disconnect? Well, one thing that Nike, the jerseys, showed was one way you try to stop LeBron, who is a human locomotive. You just grab him and pull on him, and hopefully you slow him down a little bit. But in all seriousness, it's not a good look for Nike. This is a big partnership with them. Uh, for them, with the NBA, and if they know like I know, they will have this... Uh, situation fixed quick fast in a hurry because the idea of the uh, Nike Connect jerseys was really cool and something that's innovative and really would put not that Nike needs to be put on the map any more than they already are but it's nice to it's nice for them to show to present themselves as an innovative company someone that a company that's not just gonna rest on their name alone because of course Nike is one of the giants in sporting apparel um, so I'm sure that, you know, we are about a week or so into the season. I'm, I would not be surprised if this has been remedied already. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, everything you said I agree with as far as, you know, poor job by Nike to go ahead and do this. I mean, it's on the first game of the season like this. But as you pointed out, I mean, this is a billion-dollar company. They can fix this. They can fix the issue. Um, you know, and as far as... You know, the, the jerseys are considered, this was something that we promoted and discussed last week. So I was sort of taken aback when I saw this story because I hadn't heard about it just yet. And then, so, so for Nike, what they have to do is just fix the problem. And obviously, we all know that they're capable of that. Yeah. Our photo of the week is a photo of LeVar Ball giving his son Lonzo some fatherly advice. Welcome back to What's the 411 Sports, and now it's time for our New York Sports Report. We start on a dismal note, Keisha, and I have to ask you, did you get a chance to see my New York Yankees blow their 3-2 lead over the Houston Astros and the ALCS? Well, Mike, honestly, I popped in and out of the games. Um, I didn't catch the last one. I was actually going to make a mental note to watch Game 7, and when I went to to sit down and watch, I saw the score first, and the Yankees were not, I mean, it was really bad, so I didn't watch. <laughs> yeah, it was a tough break for them. I mean, they were up 3-2. Anytime you have an opportunity where you're one win away from a championship or getting to the championship, and then you don't you don't achieve that, it's definitely tough. But I thought overall, great, great season for the Yankees. People thought maybe they were even one or even two years ahead of schedule with the young talent that they have going into this offseason. First, two most important things, making sure Brian Cashman is back, making sure that Joe Girardi is back. I think despite the fact that the Yankees came so close and then really had their hearts ripped right out of their chest, there's definitely so much optimism with this team because they have so much young talent that certainly a lot of Bronx Bomber fans are hopeful that the best is yet to come. I 
actually might tune in to, uh, some more next season. I think th there's a lot of buzz around New York about, regarding the Yankees. And as you mentioned, there's a lot of young talent, exciting talent. So I might be tuning in to a little more Yankees games next season. And um, I hope Joe Girardi stays. There was a lot of buzz about him leaving, which I don't quite understand. But rumor has it, if the Yankees don't want him, Derek Jeter in Miami will take him. And we'll just go quickly across to Queens and have a little bit of New York Mets news. New York Mets have hired their new general manager, Mickey Calloway. Now, Mickey Calloway is a former pitching coach, and we all know that in New York, in, when dealing with the Mets, pitching is their bread and butter. So, Nora Syndergaard is on board. If Thor gives him the, th the thumbs up, then we're off to a good start. So, let's see if Mickey can turn the ship around for the Mets and maybe you get double the excitement in New York with the Yankees and the Mets doing great. Well, we're going to go from the diamond to the hardwood and we're going to talk about our borough heroes, the Brooklyn Nets, who unfortunately were dealt a major blow during game one of the NBA season, regular season opener when Jeremy Lin went down with a ruptured tendon in his right knee. Jeremy Lin has surgery to repair his ruptured patella tendon and will be out for the rest of the season. Mike, with Jeremy Lin out for the season, do you think that the Nets will do better without him? Such a brutal loss losing Jeremy Lin like that. I mean, there was so much hope that this guy was going to come in after an injury-plagued season last year. I think he should, what this can do is give some of the other uh, younger players on this team an opportunity to go ahead and contribute in a bigger way than they would with Lin on the court, specifically D'Angelo Russell. Uh, knock on wood, but right now at the beginning of this season, the Brooklyn Nets have gotten off to a good start. And anytime that happens, we want to make sure that we talk about that because there's been so much, um, so many bad things, so much negative t t negativity that, have, that has surrounded this franchise that I think the fact that they've gotten off to a pretty good start so far this season in the first several games, uh, there's certainly something to be excited about. I know that losing Lynn like this is definitely going to be tough, and a week or two, three weeks from now, we're certainly going to see how much they're going to wind up missing this guy, but... Uh, I will say this, that as we look towards the, the rest of this season, which so much to play, there certainly is a level of optimism that was missing last year. Yeah, it's going to be tough without Jeremy Lin, but as you mentioned, D'Angelo Russell is balling so far, and he seems to be um, ready to step up and take, the, take charge, and maybe this is an, a fresh start for D'Angelo. Maybe this is what he needs to just get out of L.A. and, and be bogged down from everything that was going on out there and take in some of this Brooklyn air and really go for it and, and show people the kind of player that he believes that he is. I always think that this would, that the Brooklyn Nets are a team unit. I don't think there, there has been really, other maybe than uh, Brooke Lopez, one person that could really just carry the team. I always thought of it as a collective effort. So I would imagine that this will be that going forward for the rest of the season. As far as will they be better or worse without Jeremy Lin, um, who knows? Time will tell. I, some people are projecting the Nets to be better than they were last year. Some of it being just the talent, maybe talent-wise being better, but also by default with some of the teams in the East projected to be a little worse than they were last year, therefore bumping the Nets up in the standings a little bit. So we're just going to wish Jeremy well a really healthy and speedy recovery, and uh, we'll see him next year, and we'll just keep our eyes on our Brooklyn Nets as they go through the regular season. Well, Keisha, we go across the river from the Nets to the Knicks, and last week, you know, we talked about how most New York fans were really trying to reconcile in their minds that the Knicks are in complete rebuild mode, and nothing says rebuild more than when your team has yet to win a game. Keisha, I've got to ask you, the first game of the regular season was against the Oklahoma City Thunder, and of course Carmelo Anthony certainly came to play that night. Are Knicks fans sorry now that Carmelo Anthony is out of town? Also, now it's a small sample size, but are you happy with Kristaps Przingis' performance thus far? Well, Mike, there was always a, a sentiment among some New York Knicks fans about Carmelo Anthony, and they said it was time for him to go. He didn't. The Knicks weren't going to win with him. The ball stopped with Carmelo Anthony. Well, you got your wish. Carmelo is gone. How's winning now without him? Carmelo Anthony is making buckets rain in OKC, and what's happening here in New York? Not quite the same. 
as far as Porzingis goes, Porzingis, is, look, so far in this season, he's really stepping up and being the franchise, the face of the franchise. He's, I guess, trying to be the leader and really taking the team on his back. We'll see. The burden gets a little heavy as the, as the season continues. So we'll see if he, can, if he can keep it up. I like Porzingis. I wish that he does well. And I think that he has the right attitude. And we, I mentioned a fresh start for D'Angelo on the Brooklyn side. I think this is a fresh start for KP. Now that Phil Jackson is gone, I think he feels a, a, a relief and can just really propel himself forward. Yeah, I mean, as far as Carmelo Anthony is concerned, watching him on that first night where they played against, where he wound up playing against our Knicks, you know, I really felt like some excitement for him, not necessarily wishing that he was back here in New York. I'm actually excited for a guy like Carmelo Anthony because now he gets a chance to go ahead and com compete for a team that really will contend in the Western Conference. I think as far as Kristaps Przingis is concerned, this is going to be a rough year for him. I think statistics-wise, he's definitely going to put up some good numbers, probably see an increase in the amount of points that he gets per, you know, per night. At the same time, you know, we I pointed this comparison before, but this guy, Brooke Lopez, who's now with the Los Angeles Lakers, one of the things that he was able to do while he played here in New York and, of course, in New Jersey was with so much losing over the course of the last couple of seasons, he was able to stick it you know, stay in there each night, answer questions with the media, and it's tough to do that when you're really the face of a franchise, which he was. With Porzingis, when all of this losing adds up, how is he going to handle that? Let's face it, without much talent around him and with so much uncertainty with Jeff Hornacek's future and with what you know other type of players they're going to surround him with, this will not be easy for him. So far, with the Knicks not having a win yet, you know, certainly it could be very difficult for Porzingis to, to, to slug through this season. Traditional light bulbs actually generate nine times more heat than light. Switch to energy saving bulbs. Saving energy saves you money. Now we're going to go a little off topic, and Mike, we're going to go to the West Coast. And LAX, TMZ ran into comedian D.L. Hughley, and D.L. Hughley said the following Quote, The three most hated black men in America are Barack Obama, Colin Kaepernick, and OJ, and two of them were never accused of murder. They hate Colin Kaepernick right now more than they hate O.J., end quote. Well, Keisha, in an interview with GQ magazine, LeBron James says he told his kids about the N-word incident on their home in Brentwood, California. He used it as a teachable moment, telling them, when y'all go out in public and y'all start driving and y'all start moving around, be respectful to cops as much as you can. When you get pulled over, call your mom or dad, put on speakerphone, and put your phone underneath the seat but be respectful the whole time. Great words of advice. Well, Mike, this is the time we have to say goodbye to our friends. Don't throw the remotes at the TV. I'm sorry, I hate to do it. But you can keep up with us until we meet again by following us on Instagram and Twitter, liking us on Facebook, and subscribing to our YouTube channel, All at 401 Sports TV. I'm Keisha Wilson, and on behalf of Mike McDonald, we'd like to thank you for joining us, and we look forward to checking you out again. Yeah!